Welcome back to Conversations with Edwin McCain and Kelly Bell. Uh, this week, our guest is Mr. Shimon Williams. He's a friend of mine. And uh, I, there's a lot of things I can say about him, but the, the, Any first, of them public? Thing, right, the first thing I'm going to say about him is that he's the kind of person that I want to be an influence on my son. That's the highest compliment I can pay to somebody. I want him to influence my son. All and your children or just the black one? I want him to influence all of them. I just can't talk the other two into playing basketball. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Point taken. He is six foot four. But – that's what we're, we're starting with Watt. I'm going to get Tiller and, and Ben in the mix uh, some other way. We're going to do it some other way, but I don't, it, it's not going to be basketball, I can tell you that. <laughs> well, keep, keep, go on with the introductions for, for those of folks who aren't necessarily sports fans. Right. Well, we're both Green Villains. I, you know, here, we're both community members, uh, and we have similar backgrounds. I'll let them tell you about that. But Shimon uh, went to Southside High School. Uh, and then went on to play at UNC under Dean Smith and then went into the NBA. And it'd be easier to name the teams you didn't play for in the NBA. Because <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> you I played think it's for, like six, uh, six no, or six. No, no, you played for a hundred teams in the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've played all around the world too. And, and, and we have Turkey in common. I got cousins that live in Istanbul. So you were okay. in Turkey? Yeah, so we, we have a – but we're finding out more and more about each other all the time, right? I know, right? You got to find a black guy to get your Turkey reference in? I just <laughs> name-dropped Istanbul Turkey. Yeah, you did. Yes, I did. I just that did strong. that. strong. That's what it is. But, uh, you know, I just asked you the other day. I was like, hey, we're doing this thing. We're having an open conversation about this about this current climate, everything that's been happening. Uh, would you be on the show? This is what we're doing. We're trying to have reasonable, rational conversations. There's a lot of my fans that don't have any clue what to do right now, right, in this current situation, other than listen to friends like me and Kelly have dialogue and try to sort it out and try to figure out the best uh, serve our communities in these moments when sometimes you just – we got to figure out a way to talk to get through it, you know. That's Come on, so basically, we, he and I have been having these kind of conversations. We've been friends for about 25 years, and we talk about everything. Right. Um, but and, and his relationship with you is probably similar um, because it's we're getting black, there. Black, black friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he hates, he hates yeah. when I do that. But <laughs> I want, as a matter of fact, I wanted to call the show Ed, Conversations with Edwin McCain and his black friend, but he wouldn't. <laughs> He wouldn't let me do that. Can you can you give us a couple more of your accolades, man? You know, just real quick, uh, 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 because I know you're at, you're coaching right now, right? Well, I, I teach. I teach uh, kids, um, you know, basketball in the in the evenings. Well, now we're doing the mornings, but you know, just trying to be a resource to my community and environment of, of teaching the game uh, at a high level. Um, I've, I've understood that um, the education of the game is needed. Uh, it can most definitely uh, separate you from the next individual, um, but it also can give you some insight in, in understanding, you know, what the game is about. And uh, the game is bigger than just the basketball. It's, it's about life and being able to apply life lessons to the game of basketball. So, you know, for me, uh, I don't consider myself to be a coach. I consider myself to be a teacher. Uh, everything that I do, I'm working toward – uh, the evolution and the holistic approach to the to the child. Um, you know, I try to. Cons I don't consider myself any different than my professor that I had in business econ. You know, uh, you know, they put me in a position to learn the things that I needed to learn so I can go and compete for the best jobs. So even when I teach, even my my elementary uh, kids, uh, they know. Um, you know what you know. What's the difference in certain things? I can say, put the ball in your right hand, go between the legs, two dribbles, pull up. What's your inside foot? And they'll say, you know, my inside foot is my right foot. And, you know, and so when you begin to teach the game to kids at that age where they can, they can you know, process it and articulate it, then um, I'm, I'm 
I feel great about what I'm doing because, uh, you know, the, the best thing that anybody can get is information. And so giving them the information that I learned at a high level at such a young age, hopefully to help them separate themselves. And, and I have kids from all walks of life. Uh, what are you have, hoping? What are you hoping? To roll, roll your sleeves up here, Professor. Here I come at you, all right? Right. So what are you hoping that that, that teaching of that team concept and those, and, and, and those skills that you said transfer into life, how's that going to help us now? How will well, it help kids, both, both black and white? And I, and I don't mean to make it just a black and white issue, but... What the great thing about, about my classes is I have kids from all walks of life. I have black kids. I have white kids. I have Hispanics. I have kids that have learning disabilities. And so when they're in that environment, they're, they're together. And, uh, you know, you, you can't tell the difference uh, because I hold all of them accountable the same way. No one yeah, is bigger than the I've, next individual. I've noticed something that you do, and you probably, probably won't admit it, but you don't, you don't hold them accountable. You don't hold them all accountable the same way. You figure out which way gets to each one like and you create well, challenges for them to overcome and 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 it's a and, and it's it's a really interesting process because like the way you handle my son is is fascinating because you you put him up against the thing that he struggles with the most which is sort of this oppositional kind of thing but then you know he yeah, it's it's amazing to watch, and then he'll 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 get so pissed about it, and then eventually he overcomes it, and all of a sudden he realizes <laughs> that that you just accidentally taught him that lesson, and he managed to learn it all on his own. Right? He feels like he found it himself. It, it's a, it's a gift. Not that's why the teacher moniker fits perfectly because not many people can do that. Most people just tell you what to do, and they don't let you discover how to find well, the answer we yeah. call those back back door lessons yeah in those back door lessons yeah well a lot of times um when when we were raised uh people just told you to do things and because the environment you were raised in you just you took that and took what they said and you just did it you know adult told you to do something you just did it and so uh you know i'm, I'm okay with that well you paid the no, price no question you know you can pay the price for sure <laughs> and so, so now these kids are, are different. You know, they have these telephones. They have the, they, what the information age is what they're called. And so, the, you know, kids are kids are a little bit more knowledgeable about things because of these resources than than we were. And so, when you begin to look at a lot of things, you you have a lot of people that's teaching kids things that that don't even have a background in what they're teaching. Uh, and a lot of times, you can you know, I use use sports. You got some guys that's <laughs> the head coaches of power five schools that never played basketball. And so, you know, you have these people that are telling people what to do, but they've never done it themselves and that's okay. But how do you get the, how do you get the, 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 the small things, the intangibles that can't be taught in a book, you know, that comes from experience. And so now, you know, these, these kids are so talented and they're so developed. Now you have only people that have not been at that level that are capable of teaching that talent to kids. So you have them, well, just do it because I said do it. Well, that's, that's not good enough. That's not, that's not teaching anybody anything. You know, if it, you know, it's no different than we're in the classroom. If you don't understand, you always talk to raise your hand. You don't understand? Raise your hand, ask the teacher so the teacher can explain it to you. As adults and as a, a teacher myself, when a kid has a problem or wants to know something, they can raise their hand. Because now this is my this is my opportunity to actually teach them why they're doing it, and because I've been in those environments, I've been there. I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're asking, and so you know you 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 get an opportunity to not only teach, but you get the opportunity to build a relationship with that child because now they can really understand. First and foremost, you know what you're talking about. Second, second, you know it, it works for them, but you took the time to articulate it to them to where they can understand it. Because all kids, like you were saying earlier, Edwin, all kids don't learn the same. And so you have to be able to, you know, I critique myself on how my elementary kids, my six-year-olds to my nine-year-olds, I, 
I critique myself on how they're able to to do the things that I ask um, because I, I feel like if I'm capable of articulating the game to them or what I'm trying to get them to learn, then uh, I'm going to be better off with my middle school and my high school and my college kids and, of course, my pros. So, um, you know, that's that's a challenge in itself, uh, but I, I love challenging myself because, you know, you, you have some people that have always, you know, there's a kid that may, you know, you like I said, have, maybe have a learning disability. I've been in environments where people say, they're just not going to get it. They're just not going to get it, and they pass over that kid. And so I, I've come to the, you know, I've come to a conclusion and say, hey, we're asking kids to to change who they are or change the way that they learn for an adult. We're the adults. We have a bigger background in things. We have a, you know, our, you know, we can articulate things much better than the child could. So let's meet them where they are and then help them grow. And that's so, like, that's a basic clinical principle of meeting someone where they are. Meet them where but they let me, are. Let me ask you this though. But just to be a little bit more specific. And, and, and so in your teaching, um, what happens when you have one of those one of those third graders that comes up to you and, and, and is asking about what's going on? And they're referring to the climate and, and maybe something they heard, a conversation they heard in the store or in the grocery market with their with their mom or something that because it's everyone's bombarded on the news and they don't really understand. But I know I've been, I've been a contact athlete most of my life, and coaches right. played a huge part of my life. And no I, I have, I've gone to coaches and asked them many, many questions that were outside the realm of sports. What do you do when an elementary school or middle school kid comes to you and, and says, Coach, help me understand this because nobody in my house will talk to me about it? Well, first and foremost, I'm capable of having that conversation with that child. Um, I think it's important that I, I have the, the dialogue with their parents to let them know because I have children of my own. And if it's a discussion about something that I don't want to have with my children, I don't want them to go to someone else or someone else to tell them something that uh, I may feel like they might not be ready for or they just don't have my permission at this point in time. So. For me, who I am as an individual, I'm, I would say, listen, I would have that dialogue. I'd say, well, listen, let me, let me talk to your parents about this, and then hopefully I'll be able to explain it to you if your parents give me the permission. Uh, I think that's first and foremost because, you know, when, when someone gives you responsibility of their child, that's the biggest compliment you can get. Um, they're, 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 they're saying, hey, you know what? You know, Mr. Williams is going to do right by my child in every environment. And so – you know, even though this is an extremely sensitive subject, um, if I were to get that question, you know, I, I need to have that dialogue with the family. And then maybe I can have the dialogue to help them understand this is important to your child. You got to have this conversation. So now, what, would you, what would your dialogue be? And let me give you some background. I'm, I'm a therapist, by the way. I'm not just a musician. I don't right. generally talk about that side of my life. I, for, right. for the last almost um, years, I've kept... <laughs> I have uh, kept the two lives very, very separate. Um, right. And because Edwin and I have talked about doing this, this is really the first time that I'm, I'm kind of allowing my two careers to meet. But Good. I'm a licensed certified social worker, and, and, I've been, and I actually work in a school, and it's a residential school. Uh, right. So I, I, my, my, my boys stay there. They you know, yeah. are very much where you are, what, what you're talking about, and need right. that kind of guidance. Um, and sometimes we're helped, you know, as, as coaches and teachers and, and all the folks and clinicians, we kind of fill the, no disrespect to the parents, but sometimes we fill, we fill those voids. Yes. When the parents can't be there or are not capable right now or there's just so many other things going on, we fill in the blanks. Yeah. Traditionally, I think teachers and clinicians and, and, and coaches who don't get enough credit are uh, right. doing that. So while you're filling in the blanks, let's say that this pa this parent said, let's say it was a Caucasian kid, and you have a parent that says, I don't know how to talk to him about it because I'm not sure I understand it myself. So if you would, if you're willing to talk to him about it, what would you say so that he can go home not hating the kid across from him and still loving you and loving himself at the same time? But well, some kids, some some young white kids now think that they're bad. 
because they're white? Well, no. I mean, I think it's important that we let them know that there there has been some oppression for for many years for African Americans, and uh, you know, it it wasn't them themselves, but uh, uh, a lot of people that um, that are Caucasian. Um, you know, there were there were some some things put in place years before that they were born that uh, that treated African American people be you know just they felt like they were indispensable or not equal and now there's an environment where african americans are protesting what has been happening uh to them for over four or five hundred years and it's an issue that um you know, African Americans don't want to t tolerate anymore, and uh, it's about fairness. Yeah, it, it, it's about you know, for some equality or equity. Yeah, it, it's for some Edwin, it's about fairness, but some for some it's it's about not tolerating it anymore as well. You and, know, and it, for some it, it's about payback. Pay. I was just about to say it's 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 James Brown, the big payback. You know, regardless of regardless if you want to treat me fair or not, I need to get back what you've taken from me. And so, um, you know, you have you have a lot of different dispositions within what's going on. And you can talk to, you know, you can talk to three different African Americans and get di three different perspectives about what's going on. I think the one thing that they were coming to agreements with is that you know we've been oppressed um for so long and you know like the conversation we you know you and i had briefly i said you know edwin i, I don't i don't know how to look at it you know like i'm searching my i'm searching every day myself within myself because i've dealt with it and i've not allowed it to be an issue and sometimes you can become numb to it and because we don't, we're not in a position where we could complain about it. We're not in a you know position that anybody's going to do anything different. On you. So, you know, like you know, you you have the you know you have the moniker pull up your bootstraps, and or you have, hey man, yeah, you know, if it, what, what happens if you don't have boots? Yeah, well, you know, what don't kill you don't make you stronger. You know, like you know, we've right. always been in those in environments that. <laughs> You know, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't, as they say, quote unquote. So, you know, it, it it's, you know, like I, I, I check myself to say, hey, Shimon, like, were you allowing this to happen to you just because that was the norm? You know, I, I, I don't, you know, I didn't have time to complain about just, just being unjust. I, I had to get it done. And, um, and uh come on Evan, Edwin, Edwin and i talk about that a lot and i'm sure you probably had some similar conversations because he is sorry brother but here i come roll your sleeves up and <laughs> so he he gets so entrenched and i'm not saying that it's not a value i'm not saying it's because he's not a conscious person but he just gets so entrenched that he can't see the light of day and i gotta pull him back and 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 i gotta interject some humor and 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 other things just right. to kind of keep his head in the right place and 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 i was trying to understand trying to help him understand that you can watch the news but you have to be able to turn it off and the difference between being white but, but i'm sorry between being edwin and being kelly and our existence in this country is that he can't turn it off because he is so outraged and right. i can turn it off because i have lived it my lived entire it. <laughs> life and sometimes I just need to turn it off so I can go to work tomorrow. <laughs> right. Right. That's, and that's, that's a difference. True. That's a difference between black and white in America, period. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I've been looking at it from a different, like, I've been looking at it from a different point of view. Okay. So we, we, you've been teaching me things I didn't know. A lot of people have sent me messages like, hey, man, I'm learning stuff I didn't know. And, I, and so this weekend I spent time saying, okay, well, what am I going to learn? What am I going to learn this weekend? So I went and I listened to a bunch of James Baldwin speeches. I never heard his. I didn't know about him. I don't. I didn't have a single clue of who he was. And that's 
that's a shame, right? And so we're kind of back to a great you know, American writer. If if we're gonna if we're really gonna do this, it's time for everybody to go back. Let's rewind a little bit and let's do your homework. Like I got you don't have to tell me. Uh, I, it's up to me to go back here and and educate myself about the things I didn't know, right? And I got to own the fact that I didn't know it. And 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 it's not, you know, I, there's a million different excuses for why I didn't, but that's over with. Now it's time to listen, you know, and listen to these moments, and then be embarrassed that what James Baldwin is saying is still we're still having to say this right and that's mm -hmm. not okay it's right. not okay right and that's and 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 it's not and it's not uh everybody just needs to spend some time doing the homework and just listen and and acknowledge where we still reside and there have been some improvements but it's not enough it's not, and and that's why i'm I'm like I was telling Shimon, I was like, I, I'm on the ground ready to do whatever the next thing is, right? But right now, I'm spending this time, we're going to have these conversations, I'm going to learn the things. I went back and listened to interviews of actual slaves. Those recordings are on YouTube. I, go ahead and listen to that. Now, think about this for a second. Those are recordings that are available to you to bounce off a satellite and, and, People want to say, well, oh, it was a long time ago. That wasn't a long time ago. That's a minute ago, right? Now, That's a minute ago. And, and people don't, it feels uncomfortable to have to go and listen to it. But you got to do it. You have to do this. And it's different. It's weird for me because I'm adopted. So I don't have this like connection to, to I don't have like this family tree thing. I, I don't know. I have no clue. So I don't, I'm not as married to this whole idea of, I had relatives that are, I don't know who they are. I don't know who anybody is. So I, so it's easier for me in a way that I don't have this, like I'm not married to some, to some family tree. I, I'm just, you know, I, it, I don't have to go that. Again, again, that comes back to, so you're saying, and I hope this doesn't offend you, Edwin, but do you know that I've never gone on YouTube and watched any of those videos? Because I didn't have to, because right. I sat at my dinner table with my grandmother, whose grandfather was a slave. So right. she talked about stories about sitting on, bouncing on his knee, and he told her stories as, as, a, well, as he was a child when he was in slavery. And, and so it's not that I'm not well steeped in black history and stuff like <laughs> that. I definitely am. But, but to, to have to go and sometimes relive that, over and over again, and I am one that believes you need to know where you where you've been to know where you're going. That yeah. I'm, I, I definitely understand that too. But we don't have to bring all of the emotion with it every time, right? You know, like we talked about taking down the the articles of the Confederacy, all the statues, and all that other stuff. And 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 I'm I'm all aboard with that because primarily not because the stuff has been around for 100 years, because most of it's been around since the Civil Rights Movement, because that's when they brought the, the, the Confederate battle flag back. That's when they start putting all these, stir, these statues up. People are so offended, like these statues have been around for 200 years, and they have been. They, they haven't been close. They, right. They've been around since, the, since about 1955, 57. And yeah, that, I, mean, I guess what I'm getting at, it's like, I'm not really talking about for you. I'm talking about for... A, a lot of my contemporaries that have never gone and like just for just for an exercise in empathy, like go back and listen to that and think about that for a second and and walk a little bit in the shoes to be able to 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 understand where people are coming from. That's what I'm that's all I'm saying. I mean, you know, everybody like a lot a lot of people that are reaching out to me don't have any black friends, don't have any don't have any experience with any of the civil rights history and it's like hey go look go check this out there's a there's a lot to learn here well i would just like to say for me and the, and the gentleman joining us joining us shaman who obviously was given a name that uh no white person ever would have got him that he has to spell over the telephone every single time he says it for <laughs> his entire life so and, 
uh, speaking for him and myself, we appreciate your white guilt so much. Because <laughs> I, got a, I got a large pizza for the price of a small the other day. And it wasn't because I'm Kelly Bell. It was because of my uh, pigmentation. Well, Melanin yeah. is kicking butt right now. I'm just yeah, saying. Listen, what, what I can say is uh, what, I, what I do appreciate about Edwin and, and many others, like um, w once this happened to Mr. Floyd, I began to get text messages from a lot of my friends that were Caucasian um, that, you know, I probably wouldn't have thought that I would get texts from. And just some of the, the statements that they were making and how they were feeling about the situation, it, you know, it, it kind of, it kind of shocked me. You know, I was in shock. I was like, wow. Like, you know, this has really, this has really touched a lot of people, uh, you know, from, you know, from different demographics, uh, not just African Americans. Cause we, we, you know, this, you know, we see, you know, we've experienced this <laughs> day in and day out. And so, to see the empathy that people had for Mr. Floyd and begin to associate it to what, this is what African-Americans are dealing with. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was quite interesting. It, it was so, it was, it was so endearing that it made me call people back and, and let them know, like, listen, I want you to understand that I do understand the difference between a white person that's racist and a white person that's not. So I don't want you to think that because we were friends and I, I always looked at you as being racist. No, that's not, that's not the situation because, you know, we, you know, we, you know, hopefully we, we understand the difference between the two. Um, but, you know, like I explained to Edwin was, listen, Edwin, this, this is, you know, it's great to hear what you're focused on and what you're doing. And, you know, that, you know, we need more individuals like you because you're going to be the individual that's able to, you know, have those conversations with the people that look like you. You know, they're they're not going to have those conversations. You know, just to see what you. They don't have our phone number. They don't have no. It's no different. Like, and they're gonna you know, call you talking. first before yeah. they call us anyway. Yeah. Well, and because here's the thing too, and and a lot of it is because it, uh, <laughs> and and I get worried about this too. Like, it it looks like we're over trying all of a sudden, and 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 you know, just to rewind, like this has been who I. I am since my early 20s, right? I had a moment when I had to face, you know, I didn't know any black people. I didn't have friends. And then I had my, one of my lifelong friends at 20 join me and we started riding around in a van together. And we had, you know, that was my, that was when it, that's when I had my opportunity to have a lifelong friend that I'm devoted to. It also happens to be black, right? So we I got to get that guy on the show too and get his perspective of that. Oh, journey. we're going to. <laughs> we're absolutely going. He'll tell you the ridiculous stories. But here's the thing. So, so it's not. This is not some new situation for me. It's just, and this is why Kelly and I have had this conversation. It's like I'm tired of kind of of having to come back every time one of these one, these horrific things occur and continue to have this conversation over and over again. Like, okay, what? do we have to do next? And it seems like everybody that with good hearts is showing up and saying, you know what, what do we have to do next? Like NASCAR pulling down the, 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 the saying the, the Confederate flags. Like I gotta be honest with you. I'm, that's pretty impressive. Like I'm pretty. I shocked. thought I would see a black president before I saw NASCAR take down the battle flag. I, I never I, thought I would see that. But, yeah. but so that's and, so, so all right, man, let's keep the momentum, right? That's like, that's kind of where well, I am that, right that, now. That, be, that being said, that, that leads into a question that I wanted to ask Shimon anyway. And that is, so you see what NASCAR did that was absolutely historic. Now, mm -hmm. and that's for an, a, an organization that is predominantly white, both yeah. viewing, it was viewing built, audience, uh, the, the partitioners, the participants, the owners, everything. So yeah. now I'm going to shift into your area of expertise. So now yeah. let's talk about the National Basketball Association. So we, we got the NBA. What should they be doing so that we don't 
because somebody's going to do something. Some of these guys are going, I don't know if somebody's going to take a knee. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but I think that, that folks are going to come together and, and we don't want another Kaepernick thing happening because now Kaepernick is now he's getting his pats on the back now, but I mean, fortunately he made enough money that he'll probably be all right, but still they, you, they, they took away some of his best years, if not his best years. They ridiculed him. Yeah. Yeah. And they're still black and blackballed him. Yeah. And ostracized him. They did so, it all. So what do you think the NBA could do, especially in this abbreviated season and with COVID and everything else, what do you well, think that they could do to, to, to make a stand for what is probably what? 80%, 70% of the league? Yeah. Uh, probably more. I, um, there, there is a, a little conflict that go, is going on between the players about playing and not playing. Uh, because of what is taking place with Mr. Floyd and making sure that, uh, you know, we, like you said, capitalize and help people understand the bigger picture here other than just playing the sport. Um, I agree with that, but I also agree with the, the sport uh, continuing to participate and in, in, in people play um, because uh, I look at the platform and I think this, this, this platform here is going to be a platform like no other. And so, you know, I, I, um, Steven Jackson, who's a friend of mine, you know, George Ford was like his brother. And so I, I most definitely understand Steven uh, thought process of making sure that, you know, maybe there's no participation. So people don't just focus on sports uh, and forget about what has happened and what's been going on to African-Americans in the society. Um, but I, I also, I have a thought process on on this platform. I mean, because they're going to Disney World. They're going to play in a controlled environment. Uh, I made the suggestion to Harrison Barnes uh, to, to um, I mean, I can show you the text. I said, it, it, for me, it would be great that if the NBA played on a court that had uh, Black Lives Matter on it, on the sideline, wow. all the way down the sideline, Black Lives Matter. And during every game, um, you know, when teams warm up, you know, there's a T-shirt with someone who's been killed by, you know, um, police brutality. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, while this game is being, why this, you know, why people are enjoying sports, here it is on this court, you see Black Lives Matter. The thing about the NBA is, and, and Adam Silver, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's an outstanding commissioner. Um, you know, they, they've always given the, the players a platform to speak and to say what they feel without being ridiculed and ostracized. And um, I don't think any other sport um, has given their players this type of platform uh, and, and gets behind them. And so uh, I think this platform could be great uh, in that regard, uh, having Black Lives Matter on the, on the court. Um, as well as That's celebrating, big. yeah, celebrating someone who you know has has you know has died you know uh, to police brutality, um, because the awareness is going to be there while these guys are playing. The awareness is going to be there. It's on the court. Uh, the NBA, you know, this is something that the NBA. This is a statement the NBA is making. They're they're going beyond just what they've always done. You know, support. Uh, you know, they've always supported the community, but making this statement, there, there'll be no other platform like this. There'll never be, a, there, there is no other statement that can be made. You know, no one. Now, can, can I jump in with you? I, I sure. would say that I love that idea about the Black Lives Matter on the court because when the mayor of D.C. did it, that was huge for everyone. Like no right. one saw that coming and to employ artists, real professional artists to do it. So you're right. talking about, you know, guys with the platform that they have and doing that there, I think is, I, I think is great. Where I, where I would disagree with you though, is mm -hmm. the, the t-shirt part only because I think, and, and when you think in bigger picture, you, you have the, you have people that are going to say, Oh, so all I got to do is have a black kid and have him get killed. And then I get to be, and as ignorant as that sounds, you will definitely hear that. And, and, Sometimes I think some of the little messages and the little things that people weave in to try to try to disrupt a, a, a very positive overall message, yeah. I think you can weed some of that out. I think you want more people to be 
they, they have Black Lives Matter stuck in their head from looking at that court all day back and forth rather than thinking about a T-shirt that they can't see from a distance anyway. You know, yeah. I think another promote, another promotional commercial or something with all the yeah. players standing in a T-shirt, that makes sense well, to me. Well, I was thinking, like, you know, because it it's important to know why I'm saying this. That's when you can identify and then you look, you know, you look at 22 teams participate. There's 22 different names on, on those T-shirts. Like maybe each team, rep, you know, maybe represent two people. So now you start looking at 22 teams. That's a good know, point. You know, now you, you know, you talk about two, two people per team. That's 44. And you start looking and say, my goodness, that's 44 people that have been killed by police brutality. And that comes it's, back to educating like Edwin was saying. That's yeah. a good point. And so, so now, instead of just saying, oh, okay, Black Lives Matter, you know, which, you know, is important. The reason why we want you to understand this is, look, look at this. Look, you know, each and every game, there's a different name on these T-shirts. <laughs> and we're not going to run out of games. We're not going to run out of names. Yeah. This, that's, that's too many. Yeah. And so now you, can, now you can start identifying. You know, I think that's the biggest part. Like, you know, like even now, like I told Edwin, you know, when he was when they was about to go on this tire, saying, Evan, hold, stay the course. <laughs> which identify, which time? <laughs> identi hey, identify what you're trying to do and identify why you're doing it. And so now it, it allows even those players that did not want to play because they they didn't want this message to be overlooked. Now, when you're watching me play, this message is right here in your face. Each and every possession. Each and every game, each and every commercial, and and, and it also says to to people that you know to, to companies that want to endorse their products during these games, you know it's kind of like saying you know what we're, we're we're supporting this too because you know here it is, you know we yeah. want, we want, we're on our minute slot, <laughs> you know at, at you know during commercial, and we understand what they're about. And so, if I understand, it makes me want to buy their product. Yeah, I, it, I mean that's that's just that's just marketing. No question. And and, yeah. and, and, and 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 you know if you, you know because if if somebody's doing something that you're not willing to to be behind, then you're gonna disassociate yourself. But when I want to pay, you know, a million dollars to get this commercial played during this NBA games, then it, it's it, I'm associating myself with the NBA. And this is what the NBA is standing for right now, these, these times. And, 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 and then I also take it from a, let's say from a, a fan's perspective, which is, is minuscule right now, but, you know, the world needs something to pull us together. And, and you know, a lot of times sports is that thing that can help pull us together. And so I, I take it. You know, I take the opinion like, listen, listen, like, you know, the people need the people need you right now, and you know, a lot of times you want the fans to support you when you're doing things, and now, you know, the fans need you, so you know, buy in and help the fans because it's going to be a time when you're going to need the fans, and yep. so, you know, and so this is a way to make sure that you let know, hey, look, 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 people, we. We feel you. We feel you. Look at what we're willing to do. Look at what we're risking. I mean, even with the COVID-19, look at what we're risking. We're doing this because we understand what's going on in society. That's why we have this on this court. You know, this is why we're doing this. And, 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 and we want you to understand that we, we support you. We're just like you. And we appreciate you. And so if there's ever a time that, you know, the fans are needed, hopefully they can Remember that this time where, you know, the NBA itself went out and, and did something, you know, just, just catastrophic for this community. You know, it's just, it, I think, it, that's my opinion. <laughs> I think it's a great opinion. Everybody stood up in a moment and did the right thing. Yes. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of where it, it feels like to me. It's like, it's time for everybody to do the right thing. And, and, it's easy, you know, there's, it's easy for people not to know. It's that third rule, right? Um, uh, 
third of the people love you, third of the people hate you, and third of the people have no idea who you are, right? There's been a lot of people that just don't know what's going on, and that's not okay anymore, right? Now you, now you know. You know, this moment in time is, is everybody standing up and going, it's not okay not to know anymore. It's time, now it's time to do the right thing. And it's going to be complicated and nuanced, and there's going to have to be some serious conversations about how we're interacting with police officers. Because in my estimation, the, the, just the interaction between a, an officer that, that has been trained that every single stop could be the one that somebody pulls out a gun on them. They're already on edge. People that are getting pulled over are on edge. It's, it's, it, the whole interaction is flawed to begin with. Right. And if you don't get, you know, they're going to have to, everybody's going to have to start looking at the brain science behind it too. I mean, it's the, all conversations are on the table. I was saying this to a friend of mine, look, all conversations are on the table now. If we don't look at everything and listen, then we're not doing this right. But let me say this too, man. But black folks need to listen too, because the, the the jargon that's going on right now, especially in the in the press, it's like all white people need to be listening. Well, some of the white people have the answers. It's not just black people that have the answers, it's conscious people that have the answers. Yeah, now I want to know about the black experience then you ask somebody black because you don't know what it's like you might be standing right next to them but you ain't standing in them shoes right and that's, well, that's always and, different well because, I mean, you know i felt like when we first started i mean i felt like we were educating people on hey man there's like some real stuff that's been going on that you didn't realize was going on and now i think everybody kind of get i mean i hope if anybody's been paying attention and heard all the stories like okay that's a real thing now. Now let's move on to the next deal. Like, how are we going to start dismantling all of these, all of these, th these entrenched issues? Right? It's not going to be super easy, but we're going to have to do it. And all options are on the table. That's what we're doing. It. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, you know the most intriguing thing about this all is there's been many times where. African Americans have been killed by police. I think this with George Floyd really brought everything to light. Because I, I think it showed a person of authority not having a care about a person's life. And, and not care. So, so he's like, going video. Yeah, yeah. You know, with, with, his, with, his, with his knee on his neck and his hand in his pocket and just looking like for eight you know, minutes and 46 for eight minutes. That. Yeah. So, so people, now that, you know, like maybe had he gotten just shot, you know, I hate to say it like this, it, it, it we might not have this, this uprising in this regard. I think that the way that it was performed and how it took place let people really get an understanding of what some people actually think of a black American life. And I think that's what touched people from all walks of life. The world. Yeah. No it's, question. It's, and it's, that's what's different this time. But I'm going to take, take the sugar off of it because Shaman is still being diplomatic about it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say he, the guy got murdered. He got yeah. murdered yeah. on he was film murdered. by a guy in uniform, a guy that his tax money pays to have a job. He literally paid the guy to kill him. And, and three other people that stood by while it went down. And, yeah. and, and that's why they're in trouble, too, and they should be. Yeah. I don't, a, rookie cop, a rookie cop should have been able to say, hey, you want me to take over that? I mean, look, I do a lot of restraints at my job, okay? And I have right. to be in shape and be ready to do it. But there are times when it gets under your skin, because you might have a kid that's especially big, or somebody spit in your face, or called your mama yeah. a name, or whatever it is, and you got to be able to tap yourself out or have somebody or work with people that can tap you out, and you have to have, to have enough gumption to be able to step back and let somebody else do that job. No question. And uh, that's even more crucial when you're wearing that badge. No and question. The, part of, the problem is, is so many of those guys just aren't qualified to do that. And part right. of it is because you don't pay them enough money to do it. If, right. you, if you want the top 10%, then you got to pay top 10% money. If you're paying the, the bottom 10%, and not, not to insult the police officers that are out there working hard 
and 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 doing what they do to keep us all safe. But I'm saying that it would it would change it would change the level. Uh, it would change your hiring pool if you right. brought money up. You could have a higher expectation. You could put more more feet on the street. You could do what we what we all been asking about for years. Right. Black, white, and every other race, just yeah. to feel safe to go to work and come home and be with our families and and not feel threatened about taking a jog in the damn neighborhood. Yeah, like I think like we talked about this in church. Talked about this at church yesterday. Authority. And a lot of times when people are in authoritative positions, the one thing that they don't understand a lot of times is with that authority comes responsibility. And I think that's the biggest thing that's missing a lot. Like, I'm responsible for you. I'm responsible to, to, to do things a certain way regarding you. You know, and, um, you know, I understand, and I, you know, I mean, like, I appreciate policemen. I mean, there's some good policemen. I mean, there's some bad police. Definitely. There's good, there's good white people. There's good <sighs> black people. There's bad black people, and there's bad white people. So, I mean, it's across the board. And, and, and you know, the one thing that it, it really does is it puts a stain on those, those people, like you said, that really take it to heart, that, that are responsible. And hopefully, hopefully throughout this, people can identify, you know, it's hard, but identify the good people, you know, because I, I look at it from a perspective of, you know, don't judge me like everybody else. Like, you know, I'm, I'm Shaman, I'm, I'm, you know, you know, judge me for who I am as a person and, and how I treat others and the things that I do. Don't, don't judge me according to what you've seen before and things like that. Now, unfortunately, as African-Americans, when you start talking about our environments, I mean, like I said, <laughs> we looked at the physical, you know, physical effects of the racism with Mr. Floyd, but the biggest thing for us is the systematic racism. You know, like you just made the statement, Shaman, Shaman's being politically correct. Why is Shaman politically correct? Because the system you know, the system don't allow you to voice your opinion the way that you want to voice it. Uh, you could be, you know, you could be uh, ridiculed for, you know, just just being an educated black man. And uh, a, a lot of times, you know, for most, that's a threat. Oh, especially, yeah. Especially in my profession, like basketball. Like, you know, you, you know, I, bec because you are capable of articulating the game and your knowledge and your experience. You know, most people look at you as a threat as a, a, a instead of being an asset. You mean the only so, thing you can't do is dunk? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. You know, so, you know, it's, it's. I mean, it's across the board in a lot of, you know, I'm just, I'm just using it in a sports perspective. But like you said, even, even when you have conversations, um, because people can't identify with you or understand or take, you know, just take your words for, for what they mean verbatim, you have to be politically correct when you speak because you could be, uh, you know, somebody could really, you know, people could really build some type of thought process about you as a person just because you're speaking the truth that they don't understand. Right on. And I think a lot of people, I, and myself included, because I have, you know, I, one year I played the RNC back to back with the DNC. Right. I bounce a pogo stick in the entertainment world that that does not really uh, offer me uh, free reign uh, with my mouth because I have band members and they all have families. And I got to I can't go up there and crash, you know, uh, a, a private client that hires me twice a year. We both I work said, for the military. Yeah, because I because I drew up a, a line politically or, or philosophically. But 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 this in this moment, this is different. Mm. You know, this is different. Um, it, this is not. It's not okay to worry about it. In this 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 is different. Yeah, I, I'm busy worrying about it for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Edwin, I mean, like I told you before, you're right? Though. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And 
you probably have to be the platform for, you know, for Caucasians. You know, you, Some, you, you have to be that platform because they're probably more inclined <laughs> to have that conversation with you than with me. You're you know? the great white hope. No. The great white hope. No, don't put that on me. Don't put that on me. Because we're, <laughs> look, if that's true. If that's Jim true, Jeffrey's all over again. I, that, if that's true, man, just pack this up, okay? Well, wait, well, Edwin, I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, I mean, who's going to do it? No, I, listen, I, all what I'm trying to do, and I'm having these conversations. Trust me, I'm having some, some harsh you know? conversations. And what, what's getting thrown my way is a lot of Candace Owens and, and a lot of there, – there, of, there are a lot of black people standing up and saying white privilege doesn't exist and all yeah. of these things. And, and they're saying things, and I can't tell if they really believe them they believe but, it. I got a close black but, friend that believes it. But, but here's my thing. Here's my thing. I, I'm 100% I'm 100% cool with what her right to say those No question. Things. What I'm afraid of is there's a whole bunch of white people that are going to go, I don't have to listen to any other thing than this. This validates whatever I believe and now I don't have to listen to a single other perspective and and they, and it gets shut down. <laughs> That's this is the one, part that makes me yeah. sad. Well, this is one thing that I've, I, you know, living in Europe uh, has allowed me uh, to shape my perspective on a lot of things. I, I always say it would be great for a person, especially young kids, to have a chance to go to Europe, you know, maybe before they're 18. And I think, you know, it, it would work for African Americans, um, but it would most definitely help. Caucasians. And why I say this is because when you go to a different country, uh, you'll get you'll get an understanding of how it is to be a minority. And you'll begin to see uh, the oppression that you will face just because you're not you're not uh, Spanish, you're not Italian, you know, you're not Russian, you know, like they're, they're going to treat you different. And, oh, yeah. and you, you, you'll begin to see how it is to to have to conform and you can't be you or if you're you, they're going to look at you a different way. And now you begin to have some understanding of that. So when you do get back in your natural environment, when that person is the minority that you face and see, you'd be like, oh, wait a minute. You have a, a point of reference to say, oh, wait a minute. I remember how I felt when I was in Spain, then and, and no one would talk to me. Or when I tried to, you know, get a job, they, you know, they they wouldn't allow me to have a job. Or for me to get the job, I had to, I had to walk like this, or talk like this, or present myself this way. It it give you some perspective <laughs> on having some empathy uh, for others. That's uh, the why well, I, I, I I pulled one of those things out on on Edwin uh, last week, and I I told him I said. I don't know one black professional, and I know many, that doesn't have a white boy telephone voice. <laughs> see, you see him laughing? You see him laughing? Now, hey, I'm, man. I'm letting you see behind the curtain. I'm letting, <laughs> behind, I'm letting you see behind the curtain. I give we my wife one. I get, I get my wife, my, when I, who is that? I, who is that talking? It's not you. Yeah. That's not your voice. <laughs> who is that? What voice is that? I want that voice in here. I wonder if that wasn't. <laughs> He's absolutely right. You, you, you have to, you know, and that's it's and a that skill. Most definitely, yeah. you know. Well, <laughs> what they say, Jamon. We can go so on forever, well. man. He, we can write. Right. So well. That's a whole. That's a whole other conversation about when you're when you're the black kid in school and college, and the teacher and the professor pulls you aside and wants to compliment you on your B minus when there's seven other kids that got A pluses in there, but they want to talk to you because you're so smart because you're the only black one. Yeah. That so we we can get into that for for days, but Shimon, I just want to thank you so much for being a part of the show, man. You know, Thank you for having me, is, I've enjoyed myself. We would love to have you on again, man. We're, this isn't the only topic that we're going to get into. You know, Edwin is a is is an amazing musician and a, a, a great person. 
which we all know. And, and, and part of this opportunity, and Edwin, you talked about what, what can we do and we got to do something now. And, and, and Shimon, I'm, I'm always trying to convince him the same thing that you are, is that by using his platform, he is doing it right now because no there are plenty of white folks out there that have some of the same questions and want to be comfortable in asking them. And if they can see us having conversation about it, they may turn to the left and ask somebody that question and then have sit down and have a dialogue and change the relationship all no at the same time. You know, and all of that will be great until, well, you know, until a black guy brings their daughter home. But, you know, that's different. <laughs> really? That's where we're going to go? That's where, that's where we're yeah. going? Guess okay. who's coming to dinner? I know, right? Okay. Didn't see it coming. Didn't see it coming. Wham! <laughs> well, you trusted me. Listen, <laughs> man. <laughs> Never mind. I'm not going to. No, but look at here. It's all before Edwin gets himself in trouble. <laughs> And so this is all, Edwin, what you are doing, man, is, let's be honest, and we've had conversations about this, they're fans of ours that aren't going to be fans of ours anymore, just because okay of, of the conversations that we've had, you know, not that we're trying to push them out, because those are the people we want to stick around, because right. they're, they're, they're going to see Black Lives Matter on an NBA court, and they're going to turn sideways, and they're like, eh, but it'll be imprinted in their head subconsciously. It'll be there. And then sooner or later, maybe they'll be in a situation like that where they'll see something happen and it won't just be Black Lives Matter. It'll be that Black Life Matters. Well, here's, here's and what I've changed their behavior. Here's what I've been saying, because I've had some difficult conversations this week with people that are just, they, they feel like any, any uh, approaching this at all, it, it, they, they feel like they're being accused, right? And I, and I, I, I keep saying, look, just if you can just set that emotion down for a second and think about this and, and in the context of my friendship with you, we, we don't agree at all on a lot of things, but we've been lifelong friends, right? And we fundamentally have the same values, right? And most now, people now, now why can't you put that down and just listen? And just go back and, and learn a little more about the civil rights movement, not just the one little clip with the dogs and the fire hoses. Learn about the people that spent and gave their lives for this and see if you can feel like you can do better and do more and be part of a bigger solution that we can all be proud of and forget the politics. I mean, thing to do with politics it has to do with humanity and being fair. And that's what, the way I'm saying it. And I, 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 that's a good yeah. way to get us out. Hey, Shimon, would you say something to get us out? Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed myself and I would love to participate again. Um, but I think that you're making you know, the, the correct plat platform and the statements that's needed. And um, hopefully, you know, like you were talking about your fans leaving, hopefully they don't leave. They begin to understand that not only are you, you know, you're talking about, you know, uh, black lives, but you're talking about their life as well. Right. Because if the roles were reversed, if they were Caucasian, let's just say two, two African-American policemen stopped and pulled their child over, they, they would want the same justice and treatment for their child then you know they would want for somebody else so it, it, it really you know you, a lot of times we have to look beyond ourselves and and reciprocate what we will want for ourselves for others and what and you're talking thing. about shaman is love love yeah that's what you're talking about yeah. you're talking about love again man thank you so much for being thank a guest this week uh, hey, everybody, so please write in and leave uh, questions so that we can address uh, next week with our next guest. Um, uh, we're going to leave you today with some love, as a matter of fact, and it's actually from the Kelly Bell Band. There's a video called First Moments that's going to tag the end of this, so check it out, and hopefully you'll see a lot of different couples and uh, different kinds of couples and this video really is, uh, was made from, from that perspective of trying to share love and, and show that love comes in all phases, all phases. And that's what all we're trying to do here. So thank you so much again for joining us here on Conversations with Edwin McCain and Kelly Bell, our very great guest, Mr. Shaman Williams. Thank you so much, sir.
Peace to you. Peace. We'll see Thanks, you all real soon. Thanks, uh, Coach. Thank seen you the first time that you call my name something inside said my heart would never be the same sound crazy but maybe crazy is just my kind and if you go there with me baby I promise you a crazy good time only wanna be with you sound crazy.